There was a uh, story Kierkegaard tells about a duck church. And there was these ducks, and they belonged to a duck church, and a duck preacher was preaching. And they came to the duck church, and the preacher was preaching powerfully about how the ducks, God gave ducks wings, and how the wings could do great things. And the ducks were going, quack, quack, amen, quack, quack, amen. And the wings could take you where, where you ever you wanted to go and could help you do tasks that God calls you to. These wings were wonderful, and you could even, they could even have these wings, and they would fly up to God's presence. That's how the wings would be for these ducks, and they were saying, quack, quack, amen, quack, quack, amen. And then after the message was over, they were all saying, that's a great message, that's such a great message, and they all waddled back home instead of fly. <laughs> quack, quack, amen. Isaiah has this wonderful, awe-inspiring worship. He's in the temple, and he has this beautiful vision, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. that I bet you that's every pastor's heart's desire, to have the room so filled with God's glory that people can't even hardly do anything but praise. That's my desire, and I bet you if you asked Pastor Betty, Pastor Rosanna, they'd say, wow, yes, I would love that. Things occur in the presence of God. I was thinking about, I always think about that Chronicles, and I speak it a lot, that Second Chronicles 5. Let me read that to you. But what happened was, I want to just give you a little, a little heads up on that. The Ark of Covenant had a place to be. There was a stability place, this place to worship. There was some kind of feeling of order there in their lives. And the Ark of Covenant was in the new temple. And something happened. They came to celebrate this. And it was the duty of the trumpeters, and see how important the music is in worship. It was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. They're singing the house. The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. And so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I, I just love that. I would love that. Wouldn't you like to have that experience? I would love to have that experience. And we have them in little pieces. We do, don't we? And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But the experience is so powerful that it changes you. The experience was so powerful for Isaiah that he was changed in the midst, that he could never be the same. This was his prophetic service call. He was called in this service. Things can really happen to us. When that presence of God is so powerful, it takes us over. He's there for maybe an annual celebration of worship. And something so profound happens to him. It said the building shook. Maybe it was Isaiah shaking. <laughs> I was thinking... Because that could be a little scary. When the presence is so powerful, things begin to happen. And maybe, was he sitting there wondering? I was thinking, was he sitting there wondering, is anybody else getting this? <laughs> is there anything else going on? Is someone else feeling this presence, seeing this vision I have? Is it just me? Is God speaking just to me? How is it that one person sitting in the worship could have this great God experience and someone else just be in the ritual of worship? How could that be? The music is moving one person and not the other. The prayers, the message, the wonderful fellowship, the passing of the peace. How is one person being moved in the service and not someone else? I think the scripture passage teaches us about that. Let me read the first part. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. 
That's a pretty powerful vision, isn't it? The hem of God's robe filled the temple. The hem, the hem of garments, of robes, of kings and hierarchy was meant for power. And don't you remember when the woman with the issue of blood said, all I would need is just to touch that hem and I know I would be healed. There's something really significant in those words. Isaiah had come into the presence of a holy God, a sacred place, and he came understanding how sacred the presence of God is. He came understanding the holiness of God. The robe filled the temple. Walter Brueggemann says in his commentary, the temple was filled with glad surrender. I love that. I read that. I'm like, yes. Glad surrender. What does that mean to us? I'll tell you what it means to me. It means I'm going to leave at the door all the stuff that was going on in my life, and I'm going to come here. I'm going to come and I'm going to sit in the presence of a holy God. And I'm going to release in glad surrender some of those things that we've been carrying with us. Who had a bad week? Anybody have a bad week? You don't have to say. I know people have bad weeks, sometimes bad months, sometimes just bad moments. And we come through the doors and we're carrying that burden and we have this opportunity here once a week. Now, don't get me wrong. We have opportunities to worship every day, all day long. But here we come to worship for that purpose. And we come with glad surrender. We're glad to come and praise a holy God because we know who God is. And we surrender those things. We come and we say, here it is, God, and we sit and it reminds me of this guy, and he goes to this doctor and he says, oh, every time I touch something, everything in my body hurts. I touch my shoulders, and I touch my leg, I touch my feet, my head, my chest. Everything hurts. I think I'm dying. No, the doctor said, your finger is broken. <laughs> Corny, I know. But people sometimes come to worship. And sometimes their lives hurt all over. Sometimes your pain and your physical pain hurts all over. Your emotional pain, your spiritual pain hurts all over. And we come and we turn it in to God. And the hem of God, that healing place of God flows through us. I'm going to take a moment, and I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to envision what Isaiah was envisioning, this hem that has this place of healing, this place of calm, this place of peace, this place of everything is going to be okay. We thank you, Lord, for that. And if I didn't give you enough time, you have plenty of time to practice. Let me tell you something. There's something about order in worship. See, our lives could be chaos, but we have an order of worship here. And that order in worship allows us to release stuff. We don't have to think too much. We don't have to do too much. We just are being in the presence of God and we're praising and the songs move us and the words move us and the prayers move us and things move us. Order of worship is good. I just read a blog when I was just deciding how I wanted to preach this and this guy was saying, we don't need order of worship. We can just be, you know, whatever we want to be. I know Pastor Rosanna, she's edgy already. We need order, not just to know what's next. We need that. 
but you need it. You need to have order. You need to have a, come, a place where you can just be. And God can speak words to you. It's really cool, isn't it? You know you're coming to sit in the presence of a holy God. There's really something about comforting. And we sit in the midst of a holy God and God speaks to us. We're getting a sense of what Isaiah is going through and what he's happening to Isaiah. God is speaking something grand to him. He gets this feeling, he sees this vision of God. We come wanting that experience. And we come with glad surrender. We're going to surrender all those things because we are in a sitting right now in the presence of God. And we allow God an opportunity to speak to us. In the midst of that order, we're bringing it. It's in our spirit. God is speaking to us about those things that are going on in our lives. How many times do you see people crying in church and God is speaking wonderful words of healing? And we sit there and we begin to sort the stuff out and God is speaking and the music goes and there's wonderful spirit flowing. That healing spirit is flowing over all of us. What does it even mean? What do the things even mean to us, the things that are going on in our lives? What's this all mean to me? We become aware of our need for God. That's what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah found his need for God. He became aware because he suddenly understands who he is. Oh, woe is me. Oh, my gosh. I got to tell you, I do have a personal story for that because that happened to me in worship one time. Oh, my. He says, and I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am an unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Mm -mm -mm. Woe is me, I am lost. Another translation said, I am undone. I am, we can become undone in the presence of God, right? Oh my gosh, he comes undone, he comes unglued. <laughs> he is like, whoa, here I am. Everything that I thought I was is gone. And he confesses. Now, I got to tell you, I had a little joke here, and it's long, so I'm going to just give you the short end of it, okay? This priest, this new priest comes in, and he's changing things, and he puts, he puts leather recliners in the front row, and that goes really good because everybody starts to sit in the front of the sanctuary. Okay, and the, elder, the older priest said, yeah, yeah, that's good. He says, and then, then you wanted to get some upbeat music, so we got a rock and roll gospel. And the priest said, now, the older priest said, but I, I supported you on that. He said, the whole balcony is filled with people. Oh, but I, can't, I cannot support that confessional, that drive-through confessional, he says. That flashing neon sign has toot and tell or go to hell has to go. <laughs> a confessional. Something happens to Isaiah and he confesses. Woe is me. Because you know what? In chapter 1 in Isaiah, he condemns the people. Oh, God, look at these people. And then he realizes in the midst, he realizes in the midst he is the same. And Jesus equals us. We don't come. We become aware of ourselves. We become aware of who we are, our own self-importance, you know, our own greatness. In the presence of a holy, great God, we become aware of our own smallness. Those things that the ego is born from, right? Or is it born from the ego? Those things. Superiority. Jesus equals us out. This need to control, that need for power, our independence. We sit there because it's not always warm and fuzzy. Jesus doesn't call us to be servants to warm and fuzzy. But God, when God presents himself, he wants to grow us in greatness of his Holy Spirit. 
And God begins to speak to us in the midst of our glad surrender. And we become aware. When I was a lay person, way back when, I had a ministry going, and I had somebody step in the midst of my ministry, and they were changing it all around. Boy, was I offended. Oh, I was offended. And I didn't know what to do with it, and I came to worship. I'll never forget this. I came to worship, and I had it in my spirit. You know how you can be. They offended me. I'm mad at them. That wasn't right. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da, you know. And all of a sudden, I said to God, now, if I ever did that to anyone, God, you'll tell me. Well, God waited for that moment. And God told me, you have. And this is where you did it. And it was two years before. That's how long it took me to know. And of course, I'm saying, I don't think so. I don't think it's the same thing. This is your reasoning, right? I'm not sure I did that same thing. Oh, you did. My spirit was telling me I did do the same thing, and I went immediately and said, I've done a wrong in you. And it happened here. And they knew it. They knew it. God's presence is just not cozy and warm, is it? But it fills our souls with truth, and there's no denying it. For Isaiah, he couldn't deny it. And the hem of forgiveness moves in. Oh my gosh. Thank you, God, for having a wonderful spirit of forgiveness. Isaiah becomes aware of God's grace and mercy, understands God in such a greater way. And it changes him because he wants to proclaim it. He wants to proclaim the good news of a holy God, that in God's holiness there's forgiveness and comfort, peace, and all those wonderful things that God gives to us. I remember somebody I knew, their grandson committed suicide. It's a terrible time. And you don't know what to do with that, right? When I hear that, I don't know what to do with it. You have all these questions. What if? Couldn't we? Shouldn't we? No answers come. There's like that feeling of how could I have controlled it, right? You have that feeling of being out of control. That's out of control. It's done. And I went to the funeral service. I'll never forget this. And you come in that glad surrender and not in that joy, but glad you're surrendering because you have a place to bring all those questions, all that grief, all that sadness to right there at that moment. And you're just looking for God to speak to you about something. And the pastor read this scripture passage. And I know Pastor Betty knows this because she reads these for funerals. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all of a sudden, I felt the presence of God come over the sanctuary like you can't believe, and I started praising God under my breath. I mean, the words were just coming, but I didn't know why. And people began to weep. It was so powerful. And you could just stand there and live and take it in. God's presence comes for a purpose. Sometimes when we don't even call it glad surrender, we're not aware. Sometimes God's presence just comes because God understands our need for God. We need a loving God who cares enough to not let us sit where we are, but to grow us 
in his graces and love so we can go out and be set to give that. If you hadn't had this experience, you will. And when you do, you will be changed. Because the experience of God's presence changes you like it did Isaiah. And you come not just jokes and entertainment, but you come because God is going to speak a good word to you. And you know it. And it might not be next week or the week after, but you know you're coming expecting. That's why I always say sit in expectation, because God has always something to say. And no longer do we waddle out of worship. We take our wings and fly. Remember, on eagle's wings, and that is the Spirit of God that takes us out. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit that helps us to fly, gives us comfort, grows us in your likeness. We are blessed, Lord. Help us to enter into worship knowing that you have something to say to each and every one of us. We give you glory for a holy God who loves. Amen. <laughs>